At Medical Service Company, we know that selecting a well-fitted and appropriate mask is critical for patients' success in establishing a long-term commitment to positive airway pressure therapy. However, due to the expanse of mask types, manufacturers, and models, choosing the optimal mask can take considerable time and effort. A measure of mask selection success is the frequency of patients requesting or requiring a new mask within the first 30 days of initiating therapy, commonly known as the 30-day or monthly refit rate. Utilizing a proprietary mask selection matrix, Medical Service Company successfully selects and fits 93% of new PAP users with the mask best suited to the patient. Furthermore, for those patients who require a different interface, Medical Service Company employs the latest technology to scan, measure, and select a different interface chosen precisely for that patient. For more information regarding our initial mask selection process or refit scanning technologies, please contact your local MSC territory representative or visit our website at www.medicalserviceco.com. Thank you. For our final lecture in our sleep series, we would like to welcome back Amber Allen as a returning speaker. Amber Allen has been in the sleep medicine field since 2008 and currently serves as the program director to the CAAHEP accredited polysonographic technology program at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. Prior to joining Collin College, she worked as a registered polysonographic technologist for the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Amber is currently the president-elect of the Board of Registered Polysonographic Technologists and serves on the Sleep Technologists and Respiratory Therapist Education Committee for the, Acad the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. She has spoken at numerous sleep medicine conferences on the international, national, and state levels. Amber graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in communication and business communication at 19. In 2021, graduated from graduated summa cum laude with an Associate of Applied Science degree in cybersecurity. She is currently pursuing a Master of Business Administration degree. Today's lecture will focus on expanding the sleep tech role with CCSH. To submit questions to Amber, please utilize the Engage tab. These questions will be reviewed during our live Q&A following the conclusion of the lecture. To receive credit for attending, please complete and submit the evaluation at the conclusion of this session. Enjoy the presentation. So today I will be talking about expanding the sleep tech role with the CCSH. Uh, we've got a lot of inquiries lately about how we can go and expand what the sleep tech does within the sleep center to encompass this growing excitement about learning about sleep and how can we help our patients better. And so I'm going to be highlighting about some of the things that we can do with this role and how you can incorporate it into your sleep center. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So the learning objectives today is to talk about how to expand the sleep technologist role from just being a night tech to being in this encompassing role of working with your patients. Um, I'm going to also be talking about what is the CCSH credential and how you can obtain it. There's three different pathways that we have to obtain that credential. And then I'm going to talk about what knowledge base is needed to be effective in the clinical sleep health role, um, because you have to have a specific knowledge base to really be effective in this role. And then I'm going to talk about how you can use that CCSH credential in the sleep medicine practice. There's a lot of ways, if you think outside the box, of ways you can use this credential to expand the sleep medicine practice. And so the last part that we'll talk about is how to, the clinical sleep health role can be used to expand sleep medicine's reach because we can incorporate this in a lot of different specialties and a lot of different areas to take what we're doing in the sleep center outside of the sleep center. So the first thing I'm going to propose is why change. And I love this little diagram that says, if you do the same old thinking, you get the same old results. And the thing is, is that the landscape has changed in sleep medicine. We've got new advances in technology. We have, with home sleep apnea testing, a change in the po patient population that's coming into the lab. And so we can't keep doing things the same way that they've been done. We have to really think about what we can do better for our patients and look at what patient populations we're dealing with these days. 
And there's a lot of reasons why people don't like to change. There is seven reasons why people really resist change. The first one they look at is lack of clarity, fear of the unknown. So what's going to happen to my job? So usually the people that are not willing to embrace change, those are the ones that kind of get left behind. And so a lot of it is because they don't know what their job's going to look like if they incorporate these changes. And so they don't embrace these types of new roles. The other thing is a lack of skills. Do I know how to do this new thing? What kind of training is going to be needed? What kind of education is going to be needed? Um, and that can scare people. You know, how am I going to learn this? You know, is this something that I'm going to adapt to and be able to learn? Uh, another one is overcommitment to the current model and change to routine. So I've been doing the same thing for the last 20 years, and I'm comfortable with how I do things. And if I go and incorporate this new role, how is that going to change what I've been doing? You know, am I going to like it? Am I not going to like it? Uh, is it going to be something that's comfortable? Does it feel natural for me? And that is something that will keep people from trying to go into these new types of roles. Lack of trust. You know, if I go and embrace this role, will it do the job that I need it to do? Um, is it something that I'm going to, you know, be engaged in? Is it something that's going to suit my strengths? That lack of trust. Being left out. You know, if this is a management decision to start moving into some of these roles and incorporating some of these roles, why wasn't I included in this decision if it's going to affect me the most? So why was I brought to the table when you're making these decisions? And then resignation or a perception of change. Just because I'm compliant and willing to do this new role doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to enjoy my job. Um, and so compliance, sometimes you do it because you're feel forced to do it, but yet it's not really something you totally enjoy doing. And then inadequate benefits and rewards. Okay, now I'm being asked to do something that's got a little bit more of a knowledge base, a little bit more of a skill set. How is that going to benefit me? Now I'm going to have to go and pay $550 to get a new credential. And is this going to increase my pay? Is this going to be something that I find worthwhile from an employment standpoint? So when you have all these factors at play, it can make this resistance there that people won't step into these roles because they don't know how it's going to impact them. So as we look towards the future, we have to really think about what does a sleep center look like today? What we do know is that the sleep center has changed. Um, the, the patients that used to be the very easy patients, as we would say, are now the ones that are getting home sleep apnea testing. The patients that are coming into the lab are coming in much sicker. They have a lot more comorbidities. And so we know that it is a changing patient landscape. And we do know that the diagnostic process is changing because we have advancing technologies. So home sleep apnea testing has come leaps and bounds in the last few years. We see the devices getting more and more mobile and portable, a lot smaller. Um, patients are looking at wearables. If you look at, for example, Apple Watch, um, they have gotten a lot better with their sleep trackers. They also have EKG tracking and a pulse oximetry tracking. So Patients are looking to their wearables and getting information from those wearables. Um, artificial intelligence has really expanded because we're seeing artificial intelligence being able to interpret data and take away some of the more tedious tasks from the sleep techs. Um, so it's freeing them up to do other types of tasks that are more patient focused. But we see artificial intelligence has been around since the 60s and it's just continuing to evolve and grow. And technology is really increasing access to care because now with things like telemedicine, for example, our patients don't necessarily have to be in the same location to get the same services. Um, and so it does increase the access to care and because we can utilize this technology to follow up with our patients, it does help to improve outcomes. So patients are using apps to track their performance on their different therapies. And also it enhances the patient and the physician satisfaction because the patient's happier because they're getting results, they're getting feedback, and the physician's happy because they're seeing better compliance because that patient does have access to that information. And at the same time, this helps to reduce costs too, because if that patient is consistently using their therapy, then they're not going to have to be retested to get a new device, and it's not going to set that patient back in their care. 
So we do hear a lot today about artificial intelligence and machine learning, and there are some differences between that. And you'll be surprised that you actually use a lot of this technology and may not even realize that's exactly what it is. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about techniques that enable the machines to mimic human behavior or exceed human capabilities. So they're fed a lot of data into these algorithms to learn how human behavior responds to this. And so when you think about it, you've got the smart calculators that you can go plug numbers in and it creates your equations for you. If you've ever used like a Nest thermostat, for example, the Nest thermostat learns your behaviors, your temperature controls. The Roombas learn the, the map of your, your room so that it can go and vacuum your whole room. Google Calendar learns from what you're placing on your emails there. It can go and incorporate that onto your calendar. And then machine learning is actually a subset of that artificial intelligence techniques that utilize statistical methods to enable machines to improve with experience. So the more that they do, the better that they get. So we've seen an evolution in machine learning with face recognition. So using that as a biometric marker to be able to lock and secure devices better. Um, Shazam, you go and play part of a song and Shazam can tell you what that song is. Netflix learns your viewing preferences by seeing what you watch, and then it goes and gives you suggestions of things that will be intriguing for you to watch. Facebook ads, how many times have you like thought about something or was talking to somebody about something and all of a sudden you get a Facebook ad? Um, so Facebook ads really learn what your preferences are. And then Spotify learns what kind of your musical preferences are by seeing what you're playing and then giving you suggestions of songs that are similar to what you listen to. So we do have a lot of this artificial intelligence and machine learning. And because it's integrated so much in normal technology, we also see it, you know, ebbing and flowing into our, our sleep technology as well. We see companies like Enso Data, for example, that is really looking at not only scoring, but also so how can we do some patient biomarking to figure out if we can identify sleep disorder patients by utilizing artificial intelligence? So there's things that are coming in the pipeline that are really interesting, really exciting, that are really going to help these patients to identify their sleep disorders quicker. But as great as technology is, it will never replace the human touch. We still have within the sleep center that need for the physical presence. And so that's where the clinical sleep health professional really comes into play because that professional can help foster a continuum of care they highlight what areas that patient can focus on. So really by listening to that patient, getting their feedback, knowing what's going on in the process of their treatment, they can give them suggestions of what they can focus on to improve their interaction with that therapy. And then also provide education to that patient, making sure that they really understand their sleep disorder, understand their therapy, and how to comply with that therapy. And then also expanding that beyond just the patient, working with the medical peers, talking to physicians and allied health professionals and other specialties where they can go and see how sleep is integrated into what they do. You know, talking with, for example, somebody in cardiology and showing how sleep disorder breathing impacts cardiovascular function. And then also the community. A lot of people know that they have sleep problems, but they don't really know what to do about it. And so this role can also go and touch the communities and educate them about sleep and what they can do to improve their sleep. So expanding your role, you know, if you've been primarily running diagnostic and treatment testing, you don't really know how to expand beyond that. So how do you make your mark? How do you expand your role to encompass some of these where areas of education and areas of expansion? So talking about the clinical sleep health role, it's a physician extender role to aid with patient, provider, and community education. So we are working in tandem with our sleep doctors to help expand what they do. Because you think about it, if you've got all these patients that have been, you know, either need to be diagnosed with a sleep disorder or have been diagnosed with a sleep disorder, the ones that have been diagnosed, we know we're going to see them throughout the course of their life because most of these sleep disorders are lifelong conditions. And so 
if we can free the physician up so that they can go and diagnose more patients and we work with the ones that have already been diagnosed, it really helps to expand that sleep practice. Also being able to go out and reach other providers. Um, so going and being that advocate for the sleep physician and talking to other providers and other disciplines to show how integrating sleep um, and getting sleep diagnosis and treatment really impacts their patient population. And then going out into the community and making the community aware of, okay, if you're exhibiting these symptoms, you really should have a sleep study done. And so you can go and expand beyond the walls. But in order to be able to expand beyond your sleep center's walls, you really have to have a strong education in the following topics. So you really have to understand sleep architecture, the variances between it. So knowing how sleep architecture changes as a patient ages, understanding the different sleep disorders. So you have to be very well versed in the ICSD-3 and know those diagnosis parameters and the treatment parameters for each of the different sleep disorders. Understanding what comorbidities are present. So if a patient exhibits, for example, hypertension, they may have a high probability of having sleep apnea as well. Understanding practice parameters and guidelines, being well-versed in the AASM practice parameters and guidelines so that you know how to advise patients. Um, and then also patient education styles. People don't learn the same way. So you have to understand whether a patient is a visual learner, an auditory learner, a kinesthetic learner, and you have to be able to adapt your patient education styles to work with those different types of patients. And then understanding the compliance rules and understanding where that patient's at with their therapy, where they're lagging and how, if they're close to not being compliant or they are not compliant, how to bring them back into compliance. So you have to have a good understanding on these different topics in order to be effective in the role. So sleep health educators really need to be well-educated and the CCSH credential helps to test their knowledge base. So this role, the CCSH credential is an advanced credential. So it does take a higher level of education and you have to be well-versed almost to the level of the physicians themselves to really, really be a strong advocate in this area. So the certification in clinical sleep health exam is, like I said, an advanced level examination for healthcare providers and educators who work directly with sleep medicine patients, families, and practitioners to coordinate and manage patient care, improve outcomes, educate patients in the community, and advocate for the importance of good sleep. And you'll notice that I highlighted and underlined several words in this definition because we are trying to coordinate. So uh, as far as coordinating patient care, we see people with this credential being used in inpatient settings, for example, to try to get those patients that are high probability for a sleep disorder coordinated to get into the sleep lab and then to manage their care. Once they get into the sleep lab and get tested, get diagnosed, get on a course of treatment, then managing that patient care so they remain in compliance. And if we're coordinating and managing that patient care, then we're going to see better outcomes as a result because then we have that touch with that patient that is allowing them to really get better uh, efficiency with their, their therapies. And then education is a huge component of what we do. So educating patients on understanding their disorder, understanding their therapy, understanding how to put on their therapy, how to clean their therapy devices. Those are all things that are really important. And then advocation is a huge part because there's so many people that are not tested, not treated for sleep disorders. And so we want to advocate for why sleep's important and how that impacts somebody's overall health. And if we can have that advocation and get people into the sleep center to get tested, all the better. So when we look at the CCSH exam, it is a computer-based exam. So it is done in a Pearson View testing center. You go and apply to the BRPT to take that test. You schedule it with Pearson View, and then you go and sit at a computer in a Pearson View testing center. There are 100 multiple choice questions on the exam. So 75% of those questions are scenario-based. So they're going to give you, here's what's going on with this patient. Here's the, the details, specific details, and they're going to ask you questions related to that particular scenario. And then 25% of the questions are just general questions that will test your knowledge in the different areas that I explained before that are important to know. 
there's three hours to complete the exam. And once you take the exam and you go and complete it, hit the submit button, you're going to find out your results immediately. So there's no stress of waiting um, days, weeks for exam results. You'll know immediately after you've taken that test whether or not you've obtained that credential. And there are different eligibility pathways to sit for the exam. So the first pathway is clinical experience. So you have to have a bachelor's degree or higher and a thousand hours of clinical experience in order to sit for pathway one. Pathway two is the healthcare credentials. So if you've got an associate's degree or higher, and you also have one of the listed healthcare credentials that are on the BRPT's website for pathway two, you're eligible to sit under that pathway. Now we have pathway three is the newest of the pathways. And what was the BRPT, BRPT found was that we had a lot of folks that had been RPSGTs for a lo long number of years and they didn't have an associate's degree or higher. And so they weren't eligible for one of the other two pathways. Even though the RPSGT credential is one of the credentials allowed under pathway two, the stipulation that you had to have an associate's degree or higher was what held a lot of RPSGTs back from getting this credential. So pathway three is allowing those that have had the RPSGT credential for at least five years and also take one of the BRPT approved STAR programs for the CCSH, they can go and sit under pathway three for the exam. Um, back when this exam was originally presented, the BRPT did have a clinical sleep educator pathway um, and they would host seminars uh, or one day conferences in conjunction with their annual conference that would allow people to learn about this uh, area. And then and that was an eligibility pathway for the exam, but that pathway expired in 2017. So pathway three replaced that pathway. So here is breaking down pathway one, thousand hours of cumulative health experience and clinical sleep health. When we talk about what those hours contain, this would be things like education, counseling, management, coordination of patient care and outcomes. Um, and those hours do have to be validated and approved by a clinical manager, a sleep medicine practitioner, or a sleep health specialist that does possess the, the CCSH credential. Again, bachelor's degree or above for this, this credential or this pathway, I'm sorry. Um, and then international equivalents in the form of a tertiary or post-secondary education or qualification are also accepted. So this is something that can be taken at the international level as well. Um, to prove your education, you have to have either an official transcript, a diploma, a letter or a certificate from the education provider, and you only need to provide the highest level of education. So if you've got a master's degree or a doctorate, that's what you're going to provide rather than the bachelor's degree. And then, of course, you have to have BLS. That's a requirement for all three of the pathways. So you have to show that your BLS is current and valid. Pathway two is the current healthcare credential or license that's identified on the BRPT's approved credentials list for this pathway. Again, associate's degree or above or the international equivalent of that. And again, providing proof of your education, either through an official transcript, a diploma, a letter, or certificate from the education provider, and only the highest level needs to be provided. BLS is also documentation of that needs to be provided as well. So these are the approved credentials for Pathway 2. So you'll see the RPSGT is on here, but we also have a lot of different specialties that also work with sleep disorder patients that are eligible to sit for this uh, credential as well under this pathway. So if you're listed on here as one of those credentials, then you are eligible under Pathway 2 with an associate's degree or higher. And then pathway three is the active RPSGT credential holders. So they have to have had an active RPSGT credential that's been recertified at least once. So the recertification period for the RPSGT is a five-year period. So they've had their RPSGT for at least five years before they're eligible under this pathway. And then they have to complete a CCSH star designated self-study education program. There's several that are listed on the BRPT website that you can sit for. And then they have to provide proof of completion and passing the post test for that star program in order to be able to sit. And also again, valid BLS is required for this pathway as well. 
So once you get the CCSH credential, a lot of people are like, well, how do I use it? What can I do? And there's different roles that have been established for the CCSH, and each role has a different set of parameters around it. So you may have heard roles like the sleep navigator role, the sleep educator role, the sleep coaches role. And so I'm going to break down what each of these different roles entails and how it can be utilized in the sleep center. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the sleep navigators. So these are the individuals that work with patients, the healthcare team, and community resource providers. So this is more of an inpatient type of role. So they are working with patients in the healthcare facility. They're working with other members of the healthcare team and community resource providers. So this is more of an integrated role. Um, and what we found with sleep navigators is if we can identify patient populations that are high probability for sleep disorders, this is a more cost efficient option than hiring physician assistants or nurse practitioners. So sleep technologists that really have a really robust education can identify, okay, this patient's probably high probability because they're exhibiting these symptoms, these comorbidities. And so they can go and say, okay, this person probably should get a sleep study done. And they want to identify that sleep disorder breathing in those inpatients so that they can get diagnosed and treated. So a lot of times you see high correlation with your surgical patients, with your cardiopulmonary patients um, that can be identified and get evaluated and treated. And what they've found is that if they can identify those patients that are high probability, especially for sleep apnea, and get that sleep disorder breathing evaluated and treated, it's going to lead to better outcomes because um, we see a lot of surgical complications as a result of undiagnosed sleep apnea. So when they're in recovery and under anesthesia, um, it can lead to complications with their surgeries and even morbidity. And what they've also found is that these patients that are coming into the hospital, they have a reduced length of stay. So by getting their sleep disorder breathing treated, they actually heal faster. Um, they have better mortality rates. So they're not as likely to have complications or even die from their surgeries. And also it reduces the likelihood of readmission, especially if they remain compliant with the device outside of the hospital stay. So if they're using it at home, they're less likely to come back with some of the same problems that they presented with earlier. And so how might the sleep technologist be integrated as a sleep navigator? Well, the big thing is doing clinical sleep health education for patients, identifying select patient populations that are high risk, and educating them and finding out what's going on with their sleep, asking them questions, visiting inpatients on the hospital floor, especially those that are in for surgeries, um, touching base with them, seeing what their sleep's like. And then once those patients leave the hospital, following up with them after discharge to see, okay, are things improving? Are they noticing a difference from using the therapy? And then providing results to the patient's physician. So letting that physician know, here's the outcomes we're seeing as a result of this patient using therapy because we identified sleep disorder breathing. And then updating and providing results to the clinical staff caring for the sleep patients. So making sure that if a patient's put on CPAP, that the nursing staff knows to make sure that when that patient goes to sleep, that they're using their CPAP. And then also long-term planning for therapy because we know once a patient's been diagnosed with sleep disorder breathing, um, most of them suffer with it for the rest of their lives. And so we want to go and have long-term planning for therapy, no, letting that patient know how often they need to come in for follow-up and letting them know what kind of markers that they should be looking for. If they notice any signs or symptoms that shows that maybe their sleep disorder breathing's gotten worse, um, then we want to have them be able to contact the sleep center and get back in for reevaluation. And we are seeing in hospital settings, there was an article that Sri Roy put out about sleep apnea screening and heart failure in COPD patients reduces readmissions at a West Virginia hospital. So the hospitals that are employing that sleep navigator role are seeing great results. Um, one of the doctors said, it is a testimony to the success of this program that we are now getting four to five consults a day to use this service. The benefit of the program has transcended several departments and specialties, and we are often consulted to screen patients in order to detect the disorder and intervene in the hopes of positively impacting the patient's comorbid conditions. So they are seeing how getting sleep disorder breathing really impacts the comorbidities that these patients present with. And so if they can get them on this line of care, it really makes a huge difference in those patients. 
So inpatient screening, OSA probability screening tools should be administered when the patient gets admitted. So using things like, for example, like a stop bang questionnaire that can assess whether this patient's high likelihood for sleep disorder breathing. Evaluation is really important when those patients come in, especially in preoperative evaluation and in those patients that have congestive heart failure, a history of stroke or cardiovascular disease. These are patients that are high probability for sleep disorder breathing. And if they do get diagnosed with sleep disorder breathing, they should be using PAP throughout their hospital stay. So you want to make sure that that patient's put on PAP when they're in recovery, that they are put on PAP when they're in their patient room, so that they are being effectively treated while they're in the hospital. And then the next role I'm going to talk about is the sleep educator role. So this is more of an outpatient setting type of role. So this is educating those patients that have been diagnosed through a home sleep apnea test moving to either autopap or an actual titration for CPAP. What the CCSH does is review their study. So they go and look over the details from that home sleep apnea test with that patient. They go over what obstructive sleep apnea is, what can cause it, the comorbidities, what can happen if it's not treated, and then how this relates directly to what the patient's uh, symptoms and comorbidities are. So if you can show how the patient may, you know, actually come off of or have a significant reduction in like a blood pressure medication, for example, patients don't want to have to take any more pills or do any more therapies than is absolutely necessary. So if you show them that, hey, if we get this taken care of, this impacts this symptom or this comorbidity, then the patients are more likely to use it. Another area is DME. So using patient education is really critical to get that patient to be compliant with CPAP and to have success with it. So you want to go and look at those patients, um, either their app data or their download data, and see if that patient is maintaining compliance and how successful they're being. And if they're not being successful, to go and troubleshoot with them, figure out what's the hindrance, what's keeping them from being successful. And then physician referrals, you know, working with physicians in other disciplines to screen and educate their patients. And then we see that PAP compliance rates are really higher with proper education. So if you're working with these patients and letting them know how this, this therapy is improving their condition, we see that with that education, they do tend to be more compliant. And then we have the sleep coach. And so the sleep coach really is more of a it's the ones that I see that are in this role are more of a cash pay. They're doing it as their own independent businesses. Um, and so they're really focusing with patients one-on-one -on -one that really want coaching on how to improve their sleep. So it's looking at what habits are keeping those patients from sleeping well, going over things like intrinsic motivation, behavioral change, patient empowerment. So really trying to get those patients, think about when you see a sports coach. The sports coach is not in there playing the game, but they're instructing the players how to play the game. And so what the sleep coach is doing is instructing the patients on, okay, here's what I see that is hindering your sleep. And if you change these habits, here's how it might improve your sleep. And they work really closely with the patients and with the treating team. So they are not independent of the sleep center, but they work in conjunction with the sleep center and to work with those patients and that team to help them stick to their health goals and provide additional education and support. So basically they're, they're in that patient's corner as a cheerleader and educator that can help them reach their goals. And for those patients that are, you know, not yet patients, they can go and talk with people and find out, okay, they're having all these sleep problems. Hey, you know what? You really should see a sleep doctor about this. So it gets them connected with a boarded specialist um, and they partner with physicians, therapists, or other providers to get better sleep health for that patient. So they are working in conjunction with the sleep center. But what to keep in mind with sleep coaching is it's a very different than cognitive behavioral therapy. It is not cognitive behavioral therapy that is done by a board certified behavioral sleep medicine specialist. So it is not trying to, you know, do any kind of therapy per se. It's not counseling. It is more so just kind of motivation and trying to get that patient to change behaviors, but not doing formal therapy. So why are these roles important? Well, for one, it puts a focus on the patient because you're working one-on-one -on -one with patients to help them improve their outcomes. Another reason why this role is important is that 
a lot of providers don't realize that sleep is factoring into their patient's health problems. And by educating the providers, they start to look for signs and symptoms that maybe they didn't look for before and identify patients that really maybe should have a sleep study done. And then healthcare collaboration, you become a team. You're not on your own island anymore. Sleep is not going to be a separate little island, but it's working in conjunction with all these other healthcare areas for the benefit of the patient. So it is collaboration and working together to help that patient get better outcomes. And what we're seeing in healthcare is really this move towards a patient-centered care and evidence-based practice. So there is a bigger idea of looking at the patient as a whole. Um, and so this also impacts reimbursements and they want to see that the patient has, you know, the patient wants to feel like they have a voice in their, their uh, health care. And so by going and focusing on things, it helps them also to retain the information that you're presenting to them. So there is an insurance link with the pres um, for the reimbursement component. And you're really looking at what's best for that patient. So helping them know what are the options available to them, what works best for them, and also disease management. Um, and there's a numerous reasons for a paradigm shift to chronic disease management. What we see is proper treatment for most sleep disorders or as for other chronic diseases, such as congestive heart failure, diabetes, asthma, depression, they really require a period for fine tuning extended follow-up, and lifestyle changes. And sleep disorders really cannot be adequately treated in a single visit. And we know that with patients, they're not going to change behaviors they've had for some of them 20, 30 years or more. They're not going to change that overnight. It's going to be a process. It's going to take time. And so you have to continuously work with these patients. You just can't have them come in the sleep center and walk out and never do any kind of follow-up because they're not going to be compliant and they're not going to have long-term success. So when we look at the patient-centered care model, it really looks at patient-aligned care teams that focus on patient education. So what you're educating that patient works in alignment with what their, their cardiologist is educating them on, what other specialists are educating them on. So you wanna work in conjunction with each other. But in order for a patient to be successful, it can't be just that patient. They have to have a support system with them. So having their family involved, having um, friends and loved ones that are surrounding them, encouraging them on this journey. And then integration of care, working together so that all entities are focused on that patient. Customer service and advocacy. And you want that patient to feel like they can come to you and ask questions. You don't want them to shy away from questions because they don't feel that you're approachable. And you want to coordinate your care, work with the other specialties to make sure that that patient's getting everything that they need. And then the really key with this continuum of care is prevention and man management. So if we can go and help that patient's health improve, then it's going to reduce readmission in the future. And so we're helping to manage their care rather than adding on more problems. So one of the big things is involving other providers. So when we look at physician education, when it concerns sleep, most physicians have only received about two hours worth of education in their entire medical school education. So they really don't learn much about sleep. And so we need to educate other providers on sleep needs and how to recognize those different signs and symptoms of sleep disorders. So creating a list for them of, okay, if the patient's presenting with this, they, they're high risk for this. And so if we educate them on those conditions and what conditions have a high correlation with sleep disorders, then they can start looking for that in their patient population. And then also encouraging those providers to ask patients about their sleep habits. What's your sleep like? Getting a picture of what that patient's sleep like can, you know, see whether it's disrupted sleep or if it's quality sleep. And then also identifying key anatomical features that providers should take note of during their physical exams that can contribute to a sleep disorder, such as things like deviated nasal septums, large tonsils and adenoids, and obesity. So being able to recognize that in their patients and saying, hey, you've got these anatomical features that put you at risk. Maybe you should have a sleep study done. And collaboration is really key. If we're going to reach more patients, we have to show other providers how sleep medicine can actually benefit their patient populations and lead to better outcomes. So one of the things as you're trying to expand beyond the sleep center walls is you want to present data, show how these programs have been effective in other institutions and how they have bettered the, the patient's outcomes 
um, when they see that from a billing standpoint, it really is like, oh, this is a good idea. And so if you show how it's a value to patient, if it's a value to the uh, institution, then they're more likely to proceed with it. Uh, and collaboration can take place in many different settings and types of practices. So it's not a cookie cutter model. You can kind of create your own system of what works best for what is in your, your area. And having case studies of your experience in helping patients or examples of ways sleep medicine can be used in a practice really helps to open the doors for collaboration. So showing this is what happened with this patient, this is the outcomes that we saw, and this is how if we can target more of those patients, it's a benefit to that patient population. So there's a lot of different opportunities for collaboration. So there's a lot of different specialties and ways that sleep medicine can be integrated with those specialties. So pediatrics and schools, um, going into, I speak a lot at high schools and even some middle schools, talking to kids about their sleep habits because they don't realize what they're doing and how it impacts their health. Um, and talking to them about how to identify, you know, signs and symptoms of OSA and behavioral sleep challenges. We know with kids especially, that if they're sleep deprived, they tend to present with hyperactivity. So it may not be ADHD that they're suffering from, but poor sleep. Um, and we want to have a knowledge base on how sleep impacts childhood growth and development, what should be the normal hours of sleep for that age group, um, what's the normal physiology, and then that parent-child interaction as the parent also helping to facilitate that child's sleep. In OBGYN practices, things we can talk about are OSA, um, especially OSA in pregnancy, menopause, um, the effect on um, polycystic ovarian syndrome on uh, sleep. Um, so we can talk about how sleep changes during the different trimesters of pregnancy. So you have to have a good knowledge base on reproductive physiology, how sleep changes in menopausal women and pregnancy understanding how polycystic ovary, ovarian syndrome affects sleep. So understanding how these disorders are impacted. Um, occupational health, looking at preventative measures. We know that if you're sleep deprived, you're more prone for mistakes. Also being able to identify OSA in these patients and how to provide education on shift work um, for those that work the night shift. So educating these patients on circadian rhythm, um, phase shift, you know, if you're more advanced phase, delayed phase, uh, sleep promoting guidance. So giving sleep hygiene tips to get better sleep when you do go to sleep. Nursing homes. Uh, I've spoken at nursing homes before, and a lot of those folks don't understand why their sleep is so fragmented. And so, and also you can look at things like cognitive decline, because we've seen with this patient population, REM sleep, especially if they're not getting sufficient REM sleep, how it can impact their cognitive abilities um, sleep deprivation. A lot of folks in nursing homes suffer from irregular sleep wake because with being retired, not having a set work schedule, they'll sleep for a few hours, be up for a few hours, sleep for a few hours. So they have a very irregular sleep wake. So you really have to be knowledgeable on what are the normal changes in aging, um, any abnormal neurodegenerative changes, because um, we know that in older patients, um, REM behavior disorder can present as a precursor to Parkinson's, for example, um, and then the impact to family and quality of life. So how the, they're getting poor sleep, how that impacts their interactions when their family and friends come to visit. And then community and society, I mean, if I go out and speak about sleep, they're hungry to learn anything about sleep. So really health promotion, talking about the connection between sleep, diet, and exercise, and how working in conjunction with these three can help better quality of life. Um, diabetes educators, looking at how sleep um, disruption can affect blood sugar balance. So OSA and diabetes correlation, we know that with fragmented sleep, it does interrupt the insulin processes during sleep. And so if we can talk about insulin regulation and how OSA can lead to um, or exasperate type 2 diabetes is something that's important with those diabetes educators. Looking at cardiopulmonary rehab, cardiology, cardiac cath lab, cardiac care unit, looking at the correlation between sleep apnea and cardiac disease. We know that there's a high correlation between OSA and cardiac disease. And so we want to talk about what health conditions that have been directly tied to OSA. We know that if patient exhibits AFib, for example, high correlation with OSA, 
and how to recognize the signs and symptoms of OSA. So if we notice an increase in blood pressure, for example, then we want to go and look at their sleep disorder breathing. For weight loss clinics and nutritionists, talking about obesity and OSA, because for these obese patients, if they have untreated OSA, it can make their obesity worse because it is interrupting the appetite hormones and things like cortisol uh, retention. Um, so that is also something we want to talk and educate those uh, weight loss clinics and nutritionists about getting those patients um, evaluated for sleep disorder breathing. And if they get on CPAP, they are going to likely see better results from their diet and exercise regimens um, because they are not having that fragmentation that interrupts those appetite hormones. Dental offices, we do see an expansion in dental sleep medicine. So there are a lot of dental conditions that can predispose a patient to OSA. So if they've got shortened jaws, for example, with things like retronathia, um, looking at Malin, Patty, and Friedman scores, so the openness of the, the oral structures, bruxism, protrusion, these are all things that dental offices can be looking for that could be an indicator that the patient may be suffering from OSA. Um, physical rehab centers, sports training facilities, really, especially in sports, we're starting to see a lot of uh, the different sports embracing sleep um, because they are finding that if they can get good sleep, it actually improves their performance. Um, and some of the ones that have been playing sports for way past when others in their, their sports have retired uh, really took hold of sleep. Tom Brady has been one of the biggest advocates for sleep and he was able to play to his mid forties. So um, we want to talk, especially in student athletes about the release of growth hormone during sleep, um, the impact of sleep and its uh, impact on muscle repair pliability. Um, we have seen that for some of these young athletes, having early morning practices can actually impact their muscle pliability. So they actually perform better in sports if they're allowed to sleep in and have practices more in the uh, afternoon, evening versus first thing in the morning. Psychiatry, psychology, um, pretty much every single psychological condition has some sort of sleep disruption. So we want to educate people in this area about recognizing sleep patterns, um, talking to them about sleep hygiene tips with their patients, because um, sleep disruption is a key in a lot of these psychiatric conditions. Oncology, looking at sleep and cancer, talking about how cancer can affect their sleep patterns, Sleep hygiene tips for cancer patients is another key. Ear, nose, and throat specialists looking at airway management. So looking at what risk factors are present. So if they have enlarged tonsils, adenoids, upper airway crowding, rhinitis, septal deviations, these are all things that they're going to want to look at in their exams that would put a patient at high risk for OSA. So as we look at for expansion beyond the sleep center walls. You really have to keep in mind that things don't happen overnight. Um, you know, you have to envision what do you want the future of your center to look like? How do you want to see it grow? How do you want to see it expand? And then you have to develop tactical steps. So look at how you can start doing different little things to start moving in the direction that you want to see your center go. Um, look at how the sleep tech role can be expanded, but you got to be realistic. You know, you can't do 50 different things all at once and expect good results. So what you want to do is create baseline metrics to show how this role can expand the practice, show how this brings revenue into the center, how this also impacts patients, and then show marketing plans for how you can target these collaborative areas. How can you work with these different specialties that are either within your hospital or if you're in a, a medical center practice, there are other areas that are in close proximity to your center. How can you work with them? Have a web presence. Um, social media is huge. And so uh, having a LinkedIn page, Facebook page, Instagram page, TikTok, these are all things that are really helping people to find out about your center, find out about your what you offer in your center, and doing community events. If you find an event going on, have a table there. Um, make yourself known in your community. So, or even host community events, you know, at Christmas time, have a little community sleep event um, that you can educate people in your community about sleep. And so as far as more informational resources for CCSH, one of the big questions that always gets asked is how do I get reimbursed? 
Well, VRPT does have a sleep educator reimbursement guide on its website that shows how various labs and clinics are using the billing codes for uh, these roles. Um, so there are new um, RTM and RPM uh, codes that are out that can be utilized with this role. And then how can I learn more about how to use this role? I, even if you have a CCSH uh, credential already, these STAR programs came out after the credential was in place. So going through some of these programs can really show you different ways that the credential is being used and different ways you can kind of think about how to utilize this in your practice. So there is a lot of tools that are available out there. And so as we look and move into the future, you have to think beyond what you're doing now because things are going to change. You're going to see technology is going to still continue to evolve. We're going to see all these different tools continue to evolve. And so as you move into the future, it's you're going to be, as the sleep technologist, we're still going to have certain patients that are still going to always need an in-lab study. But how can we work with these patients that are utilizing the out-of-center testing and different testing methodologies to work with those patients and make sure that they stay in compliance, that they have good outcomes? So we have to be forward thinking. We have to think outside the box. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can utilize these credentials um, and utilize these roles within your practice. So I will open the floor now to questions. Hello, everyone. Hello, Leo Nizzi with Medical Leo Service Company here Service with Amber Allen. Amber, 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 thank you so much for not only closing out a fantastic sleep track to the day, but being a repeat speaker at the JSM event. It's incredible to have you back giving another great presentation. Um, so I want to jump right into some questions for you if you're ready. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. So first question for you, Amber, is how do you get physicians to incorporate the techs more into the overall plan rather than just acquiring the testing? So the way that you can get that integration between the physicians and the sleep techs is to present them with a plan. If you know of ways that you can expand your center's practice, showing the physician's data, showing how you can be incorporated into that plan really helps to open the door for those conversations and to move forward some of these actions. Because um, if the physicians don't know how you can be utilized and sometimes they are not thinking outside the box where the tech might be thinking outside of the box, if you present those ideas and the data to back them up, it usually will open those conversations conversations. Wonderful. And I know a lot of the questions that came up uh, were kind of intriguing in the way that there was a lot of people listening to your presentation that want to be more involved uh, in not only the care of the patients, but the practice as well. So a uh, great question, great answer. It was exciting to see so many people want to take on that more responsibility, which we're always looking for. Uh, next question for you, Amber, is how do you envision health systems can work to improve care integration and coordination through the CCSH credential? So we're starting to see, looking at patients that are inpatients, there is sleep navigator roles now that will work with those inpatient populations to go and see if they're high probability for a sleep disorder, learning how to work with these different specialties that have populations that are high risk for sleep disorders. Um, so as we use those integrative roles for the inpatient setting, then we have sleep educators that are working in that outpatient setting. So once we get them identified through the other specialties or in the inpatient setting, then we can get them moved into the sleep clinic for a continuous follow-up. And so then the CCSH role can help the physicians in that follow-up, that clinical follow-up, throughout the course of that patient's life. Cause we know with sleep disorders, most of them are lifelong conditions. And so if the physicians are having to work with these patients throughout the entire course of their lives, it's not freeing them up to work with those patients that really do need to be diagnosed and evaluated. So with the CCSH role, it helps to work in conjunction with those physicians to expand the practice, help those patients to be compliant, to make sure that they're getting regular follow-up so that if their treatment measures need to be updated, we can go in there and get them on the best course of treatment for the best possible outcomes. Wonderful. Thanks, Amber. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question for you. Is there any insurance reimbursement for having a CCSH credentialed person on staff 
can they bill for their time spent coaching patients? There are some billing codes. So as I mentioned at the end of my talk, the BRPT does have a reimbursement guide. If you go to brpt.org and click on the CCSH link, they do have a reimbursement guide that has evaluation and management codes that can be used. And also earlier this year, we had some new um, remote patient monitoring codes. There's at least four different codes within the remote patient monitoring that can also be used to bill for services of a CCSH. Oh, wonderful. So I believe that this was exactly what you were talking about, but we had maybe a clarification question. If you can go through it, maybe just a little bit slower, because it seems multiple people are looking for the references. Another question was just, where do we specifically look for those reimbursement codes through the BRPT? So if you go to brpt.org, you'll see there's three tile boxes, one that says CPSGT, one RPSGT, one CCSH. If you click on the CCSH link and go down further on that page, on the right-hand side, there's a box that says reimbursement guide, and that reimbursement guide has those codes listed. Wonderful. Well, thank you. We went through all the questions for you today, Amber. Again, it's, it's fantastic to have you back at the JSM Forum. I always appreciate your talks. They go a little bit even beyond the clinical nature of a lot of our other presenters. So it's a, a perfect mix in, and it's a great way to end the day. So thank you again for joining us today, uh, and we really look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you for the care you put into not only the patients, but the clinicians, right, that are behind the scenes doing all the hard work. Uh, that we know goes into treating these patients every day. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for having me. I appreciate Wonder it. Wonderful. Thanks, Amber. And just a couple closing remarks um, for everybody listening out there. We just want to remind you that all evaluations for the event lectures need to be completed before midnight Eastern Standard Time today. For those of you who missed the survey, they will be available after 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please click on the session, wait for a minute, and then the survey will pop up, allowing you to complete it. And now for closing remarks from our CEO, Josh Marks. Thank you for spending your day with us. Today, we enjoyed the opportunity to learn from the best in the nation in sleep and respiratory disease management areas, as well as our newly added nutrition and diabetes offerings. I am honored to wrap up this day dedicated to professional growth and education. We hope you learned at least one something new today. Those of you earning CEUs from today's event, you can retrieve your certificate by clicking on the account link in the left-hand vertical navigation, scrolling to the bottom of the screen until you see attendance certificate and clicking request new certificate. Your certificate will detail all earned CEUs. CEUs were earned through the completion of the evaluations for the lectures you attended. We want your feedback. Today's event means a lot to us, and we want it to bring as much value as possible to you. Please be on the lookout for our email survey in the next few days. We appreciate you taking the time to complete it so you can help us make this event the best it can be. In closing, a warm thank you to our speakers, our sponsors, and our fellow DME partners. A special note of appreciation to our MSC team members contributing to this event, especially our planning committee led by Julie Banez and Caitlin Summer. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you and see everyone next year.